So let's get starting with this webinar. So this is the introduction to the NRF21 540RF front end module for range extension. Um, so presenting today is going to be me, uh, Paul Kostnes. Um, so I'm a technical marketing manager with Nordic Semiconductor. I belong to the product management uh, team here in Norway. Uh, among other products I take care of is the 21540 front end module. Uh, we will also have uh, Bjorn Kvola, uh, who is helping out with uh, with uh, with the chat, the questions, and so on. Um, so before we get started, let's go through the practicalities a little bit. So the uh, length of this webinar is around one hour. Um, questions are encouraged. We 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 like interacting with everybody. Um, please do type the questions in the top of the right sidebar where there is a uh, ask questions box. All the questions being asked are anonymous, so nobody else will be able to see what you ask. Uh, try to keep them relevant to the topic, and as today we are talking about uh, the NRF21540 front-end module, uh, this is what we're going to focus on. Um, we will answer towards the end, because uh, when I'm doing the, the presentation, it's a little bit tricky to, to keep track of all the questions coming in at the same time. Um, the chat is not anonymous, and we do not uh, use it for questions. Uh, we will check what's being asked there as well and, and commented, but uh, it's preferred to use the, the, the questions box on the top right-hand side. Um, if you have more questions after the show, or if you have uh, questions that are not relevant to the, today's webinar, please go to DevZone and ask questions there. We do pride ourselves in answering their uh, quickly and accurately, we have a lot of our team is monitoring there and answering questions as well as uh, people from the community. Um, we will make a recording of the webinar available together with the presentations uh, after the event is over. Uh, you will find them at webinars at uh, .nordicsemi.com. So the agenda today is, of course, uh, why is and when do you need to have a front-end module? When it is beneficial for you to, to use it? Uh, we will go through some of the technical details about the 21540RFM. Um, we will also talk more about the kits and uh, what we have available. Uh, and we will also talk a little bit more about the software and hardware tools that uh, you can use to kickstart the, the development and how to actually get the the 21540 up and running uh, quite quickly. Um, so if you, uh, and also at the end, of course, we will have a QA and a session. Um, so the 21540, the front-end module, is complementary to our product lines in the short-range market, so the 52 series and the 53 series. Um, they will plug in nicely with the devices and uh, enable you to get a better range uh, with these devices. Um, so some of the highlights of the, the 21540 is, of course, that with the front-end module, the key thing you're trying to achieve is to get a better range. Uh, we are seeing that for the 52 and for the 53 series, we get a increase in range, a theoretical range of between 6.3 and 10 times uh, when you're using a symmetric link. That means that you uh, have the front-end module on both sides, and you have the same devices on on on, on each end. Um, these are theoretical values that require you to be line of sight and so on. In real life, um, you will see different uh, behavior depending on the environment you're operating in, and also depending on what is the limiting factor in the uh, in your um, in your uh, communication link. We have the testing ex, uh, outside for with our devices where we compare the 52840 uh, running at 8 EBM, where we are able to go uh, around 1.5 kilometers. Uh, and with the front end module, we are able then to go more than 4.6 kilometers. So you get a significant improvement in the, in the range there. Uh, the reason why you're not getting the, the theoretical value that you should be able to get has to do with environmental factors and so on. But you can see that you, you do get significantly further out. And we're also seeing that this is being a big improvement when you're looking at running them indoors. Uh, you get much better range between in buildings where you have walls and so on, impacting the, the, the signal strength. Um, 
Another thing which is really nice with the 21540 is that we have uh, internally adjustable gain. So we can tune the, the output gain to, uh, to uh, different settings and we will that just be able to, uh, to stay very close to the maximum limits in, in uh, what you're allowed to use in different regions of the world. Uh, typically you're seeing limits of 10, 14 and 20 dBm depending on, on what you're running or um, what kind of protocol you're running, what region you're running in and so on. Uh, we have a nice uh, table on our website uh, under the front end module uh, page where you can be able to see uh, how we interpret the rules on what should be uh, qualifiable within the different regions. Um, and of course, from our side is that we always like to, to make life easy for our customers, try to make it easy to, to use our devices. Um, and because of this, we focus quite hard on uh, making the software solution with the 52 and the 53 series, as well as the hardware solution, uh, easy to, to, to get set up and uh, to be able to provide an attractive price performance combination so that if you want uh, or you need the, the higher output power and the longer range, you will be able to do that uh, and still stay within your, your product budget. Um, we are seeing quite a lot of applications where this increased range is, is wanted. Uh, we see it for asset tracking. It allows you to run uh, longer ranges inside big warehouses. You need less units to cover the same space. So if you have units uh, mounted in, uh, in the building to be able to track if devices are inside or outside and so on, you'll be able to do that uh, with fewer um, wall-mounted units, you know, to be able to, to track them. Uh, for industrial, we also see a, a nice need for uh, increased range and also for increased robust robustness. When you have a higher link budget, you will be able to st sustain more noise and still be able to cover it. Um, Audio is, is coming up as a big market for Bluetooth Low Energy because of the, the Bluetooth Low Energy audio extension that came with Bluetooth 5.2. Um, the range is, is typically maybe not the, the longest one, but to be able to ensure that uh, you get a good link uh, independently of where the units are placed, a lot of times we see that there is a want for having uh, higher output power to secure that the link is always running. And also have in mind that if you start dropping packets when you're doing Bluetooth and so on, uh, you will typically get retransmits and that will impact your power consumption negatively. So being able to secure the link uh, uh, without having uh, packet drops and so on is actually in a lot of cases a, a power benefit. And of course for smart home uh, where we see uh, the importance for robust connections for bigger houses of wall penetration and making sure that the link doesn't go down. Um, and uh, a lot of the, the things you're using for, uh, for home automation and so on, um, you have static units and they can't be moved around. So because of this, the link uh, becomes more critical. If you have a issue with reaching your phone, you know, they normally will notice it and you change and you move the phone around. Uh, with the smart home, you don't have that option with the thermostats and, and uh, switches and whatever that's mounted uh, solidly on the wall. Uh, you need to make sure that the link works all the time. Um, we also added antenna diversity specifically for these kind of, of features. So a little bit on the 21540. So this is a, our first RF front end module uh, for the short range market. And it's a very versatile device. It does support all of the uh, protocols that we can run on our devices. So Bluetooth Low Energy, Bluetooth Mesh, Thread Zigbee, and you can also run it with 2.4 gigahertz proprietary protocols. Um, you can run it with, uh, with uh, devices from other vendors as well. This is a front-end module designed for constant envelope modulation schemes. So it will work with, uh, as I said, with, uh, with the protocols you've seen above, it will not work with Wi-Fi, for instance, because that is using a, a non-constant envelope uh, uh, modulation scheme, um, but it's a very it's a very nice device with the good flexibility on what you can do with it. Um, it comes with a built-in low noise amplifier. This has a 13 dB received gain with a very good uh, noise figure all the way down to two and a half dB, uh, and this gives us up to five dB improvement in RX sensitivity for the 52 and the 53 series. Um, so you basically end up around 100 uh, minus 100 dBm um, 
sensitivity when you, when you're using the front end module together with with those devices. And we also have a configurable TX output power up to uh, plus 21 dBm. And uh, normally you would run it at plus uh, 20 because that's where the regulatory limits kicks in in most regions. Um, so the device is is available in full volume production from our side. So normal lead time supply for this. Um, and if you use the NR21540 together with the SOC, so a wireless transmitter uh, side, uh, it will be configurable because of the of the gain adjustment we support with the device. So you will be able to configure it to be Arib, Etsy, and or FCC approved. Uh, you will have the possibility to make it multi-region because you can tune the gain depending on the region you're in, uh, as long as you inform the unit on, on what kind of uh, output power settings it will be allowed to use here and uh, here and now. Uh, you can see this in uh, a lot of the um, a lot of home automation solutions. They will require you to to provide a location uh, before you are able to set them up, and that's basically to make sure that they can tune all of the radios inside the units to be uh, compliant with uh, with the region they're operating in. Um, so we have uh, interfaces for the for the configuration and, uh, and running of the device. So we do support both TPIO control uh, as well as SPIO uh, control, or to use a combination of them. Um, today with the, with the SDK, we are only using the TPIO control. We are going to add SPIO control later on. Um, and we use this one for TX gain control. Uh, we do it for antenna switching as well as between power modes. So we're cycling through this one. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about the details on, on how we do this later on. Um, so the device has single-ended uh, inputs and outputs, so 50 ohm matched. Um, one of, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things we have added, is, uh, added to it and which is being used quite a lot in, in home automation is antenna diversity support. So on the output side, we have two antenna ports, uh, meaning we can have uh, you can switch between them it will be possible to switch um, for uh, for thread Zigbee. We will be able to pick the antenna with the best signal. Uh, for Bluetooth, you will have the op opportunity to switch between them. The, the reason for the difference has to do with uh, um, with the uh, with how the the packet structures is made and and uh, uh, and the preamble that's being used for Bluetooth is very short. For thread Zigbee, it's very long, so we have the possibility to actually measure the the signal strength of the uh, of the preamble and decide which of the antennas is best. Um, so as I said earlier as well, so this one has a front end. Mod uh, this front end module has both a PA and an LNA, and there is no bypass mode uh, support. So when you're doing the transmission uh, transmit, you will always use the PA. When you're doing the receiving, you will always use the LNA. Um, so this is. Uh, uh, set up the way it is to, to make sure that we get the best uh, performance on the receive side. Um, and uh, since it's designed to be working together with uh, with our 52 and 53 devices, it supports the same uh, operating voltage ranges as we do of these, so 1.7 to 3.6 volt supply range, and also to make sure that we can use it uh, together with the, the extended temperature range devices, it goes from minus 40 to plus 105. Uh, and for the package versions, it's only one option. It comes in a 4 by 4 millimeter QFN16 with a 0.65 millimeter pitch. So it's a quite uh, small package with uh, with a large enough pitch, so it's easy to assemble. And the QFN packages are really nice for uh, uh, are really nice for RF performance. Uh, <clears throat> so to support the development of the uh, support development with the NRF 21540. Uh, we offer a, a tools package called the NRF 21540 Development Bundle. So this is one package that you buy this one, and then you will get a NRF 21540 DK as well as a 21540 EK together. Uh, so this only option, uh, the only uh, ordering code available is this one. You will be able to go to our website if you go to the to the um, Page for 21540DB, you will be able to there uh, to go to a buy now button and be able to see how many kits are um, stocked with uh, our different distributors. So you'll be able to place orders uh, through that page or, or find a place to, uh, to place orders through that page. Um, so 
since there are two two kits inside the bundle, they have slightly different feature set and and slightly different use cases. The twenty one five forty DK is looking like all of our DKs is a classic DK solution with the debugger on it. So there is a J Link uh, uh, mounted on the device with a USB port for the J Link. Uh, there is also running on with a 52840 device on this one, together with the 21540. Um, and you have the USB plug for the 52840 on it, as well as the NFC connector. Um, as we do have, um, as we do have uh, antenna diversity support for this one, we have added two antennas. They need to be spaced quite uh, far from each other for this to be functional. Because of this, we have now used uh, chip antennas uh, compared to what we normally do on our DKs, where we do have PCB antennas. Um, but we still have the SWF connector, so you will be able to plug in uh, measurement cables if you want to check the performance directly on the kit. I will talk a little bit more about uh, the DK afterwards. Um, and uh, Basically, when you're looking at the DK, it's a 52-840 DK where we have integrated the 21540 with it. So the kit looks uh, the same from the pinout and the functionality uh, as a 52840 DK. When you plug it into your PC, it will actually show up as a 52840 DK. This one, since it is a complete kit, uh, it's very useful if you want to test RF performance of a finished product without having to do any kind of hardware work and without having to wire anything. Uh, one thing we had to do compared to the 52840 DK is to remove the quad SPI uh, flash that is mounted on, on, on the 52840 DK is because we needed the extra pins uh, for the control of the 21540. Uh, but besides that, if you have code that is written for the 52840 DK that doesn't use the quad SPI flash, they will run on the 21540 DK as well. Uh, the additional kit that uh, is different from what we've done before is the 21540 evaluation kit or the EK. So this is a very simple kit where you have um, you have the front end module mounted on it with a minimum amount of uh, components around it to be able to, to run. Uh, it has antenna port in and antenna port out. Uh, and it comes in the form of an Arduino shield. Um, so this one has uh, SMA connectors for, uh, for connecting to the to the transceiver side or to the SOC side or to the uh, test uh, signal generator if you're using that. And it has two antenna ports that can also go either to antennas or you can connect them to the measurement equipment. Uh, so it's um, compatible with all of the DKs that we're using for the 52 and the 53. Uh, series, but as well, you can use it with uh, uh, with other vendors' DKs, and this is possible basically because it's all SMA based, and you will have the possibility to wire to all of the the, the pins on it uh, to be able to access it. Uh, one of the key places where it's really nice is if you want to do measurements on the uh, the front end module itself. Uh, you, since you have control of both the inputs and the outputs, you will be able to connect it directly up to signal generators. Uh, and, and so on to be able to uh, to do testing um, that way. Um, so when we say that you get up to 10 times range increase, this is uh, a factor of the improvement in sensitivity on the receiver side, as well as in the on the transmitter side uh, with the increased output power. So if you look at these ones, this is the 52840. Uh, versus the 52840 together with the 21540. So the top one is for the 52840 DK, the bottom one is for the 21540 DK. Um, so when we're seeing this one, uh, you can see that we get an improvement both in the transmit side uh, for the 52840, it's actually up to 12 dB. Uh, and for the receiver side, we end up getting up to around 100 dB. Uh, so for the 50, uh, using the, the front-end module together with the 52840, we get about an eight-time range extension, uh, which is quite significant. Um, and this is achieved, as I said, with uh, with both the transmitter side and, uh, and uh, the receiver side being improved. Uh, so we're seeing this being useful for all of the, of the protocols that we do support. Um, also very important is that you do get an increased uh, link robustness. So 
when you have a high and uh, have a higher link budget, you will be able to to, to tolerate more noise, uh, more interference from um, from other devices in the area. Um, and the benefit with having an increased link robustness is that we minimize the packet loss and retransmissions, so you get improved uh, communication latency, and also in some cases that may actually be beneficial for the for the power consumption. If you start to drop a lot of packets, uh, you need to do a lot of retransmit. Um, and being able to do the dynamic output power adjustment, you will be able to update, optimize the link budget so that if uh, you can measure that, yes, I have plenty of signal, you will be able to pull down the, the gain in the front end module. And because of that, you will be able to then optimize the, 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 the range versus the power consumption. So you can trade off between these to make sure that you have a, uh, a robust link. It's robust enough. It's not any stronger than, than, the, than it needs to be. So to give a little bit of an overview on, on what we are seeing with the actual link purchase here, uh, you can see here, these are for all of the 52 and the 53 devices that we have available. You can see the RX sensitivity, the improvement in the, uh, in the sensitivity with the front-end module, the output power you have available, the improvement with the front-end module as well, and then the uh, resulting link budget and, um, uh, and the, the, the range we are getting with this. Um, and you can see here that there is a bit of difference between the devices uh, they they vary in sensitivity from minus 95 to minus 98. When you put on the front end module uh, with the two and a half dB uh, noise factor and the 13 dB gain, we end up typically with about uh, uh, minus 100 dB uh, dBm sensitivity for all of the devices when you add the front end module. And of course, when you add the front end module PA, we get up to uh, 20 dBm, and that's why you will see the, the the varying in in the range you can get with the parts. Uh, and why, the, why we get uh, different impact for different devices. Um, so as, as I kept saying that we have, do have an adjustable output power. And this one is a really nice feature because we, we do everything from internally inside the front end module. We do not require you to have any external uh, components, uh, complexity to the system to be able to do <coughs> Uh, to be able to adjust the output power. Uh, and it's also quite fine grained, so we are able to tune it nicely inside the, um, uh, towards the limits where you are allowed to go with Etsy and FCC and with Arib and so on. Um, and also we have the uh, possibility to do this dynamically, so you will, able to, you will be able to tune it for temperature drift and so on and voltage drift if you can measure these parameters, you will be able to tune um, the tune the gain depending on where on on the conditions you're operating in right now. Uh, so target for us is of course to be able to do worldwide coverage with with the device and and to be able to or to enable all of our users and customers to to push it to the to the towards the border of what's uh, allowed to be done so that you can get the, the maximum range. Uh, and robustness of all of the devices uh, wherever you go with them. Um, so we have uh, different ways of doing it. It's easy adjustments is possible to both through SPI and GPIO, or you can do a combination of both. Uh, so if you're using the, the, the GPIOs, we will have two presets uh, that have two different uh, settings. They come from the factory tuned for 20 dBm and for 10 dBm. Um, these can be changed, these presets can be changed through the SPI interface during production. They can only be set one time, it goes into an OTP memory. Uh, but then you can set arbitrary values if you want to. Uh, and of course, if you use the SPI, you can change the gain settings for every every uh, packet you want to transmit. It's, uh, it's very flexible in this way. Um, so inside the device, we actually tune the gain uh, through an internal register. This is uh, a five bit register, so you have 32 uh, different uh, steps you can you can go through. Uh, as with a lot of designs where you have tunability like this, there is a curve uh, looking similar to this one where you have a non continuous point in the middle. Uh, this is actually because this is the most efficient way to, to build hardware like this. Uh, we will pick the best points for the 20 dBm setting. 
uh, during our production test, we will also pick the best point for the 10 dBm setting. And in this case here, the 10 dBm setting is somewhere around seven or eight or nine, uh, while the 20 dBm setting is around 25. Uh, and then you will be able to move a little bit up and down uh, compared to these values, you know, um, to be able to find the best point. Um, and as I said, we calibrate each and every unit in our production line. So you do get them pre-qualified for, uh, uh, for the standard operating conditions, which is three volts, uh, 25 degrees for a 10 dBm setting and for a 20 dBm setting. Um, so the hardware piece is, is, is one thing. The second thing is, of course, to have the, the software support. Um, so we worked very hard to make this as easy as possible to integrate into applications. Uh, we integrated the support for this into the NF Connect SDK. So this is the uh, recommended way to work with our devices uh, today. Specifically, if you want to run the front-end module, there is way better support for this in the, uh, the Connect SDK. Uh, we built it into this, uh, um, this multi-protocol service layer called MPSL. So this is a feature that's built into the SDK to allow us to run multi-protocol on on the 52 and the 53 devices, so you can run Bluetooth together with Zigbee, for instance, and so on. Um, and we built the support for a front-end module into that piece there. Um, there is also driver support in the Connect SDK and NR5, uh, no, in the NR5 SDK for Thread and Zigbee in uh, version 4. Uh, this is much simpler. You don't have all of the flexibility. Uh, we will add more functionality into the Connect SDK, where you will get the, the, the gain adjustment is coming later on where you were able to tune the gain uh, very dynamically for, uh, for the devices. Um, and one of the reasons why, why we see this as being important to build into the SDK and provide the drivers from our side is that to be able to run the front-end module and to be able to use it together with, uh, uh, with the communication stacks we're running, you need to have a tight integration between them. And you also need to be able to utilize all the features in the, the front-end module to the maximum and as well making sure that you don't use any more power than you need to do so. and if you're looking at the operational states of the of the front-end module uh, you have the power down state which is a default state we stay in when you're not running uh, when you're not using the radio at all this is a, a mode where we're consuming incredibly uh, low amount of current it's in the nano amp range as soon as you want to start using the device, you will need to move to the PG state. So this is a program state. Uh, you have the possibility to go to the UICR state, where you basically is to program the, the, the presets for the, for the gain setting. You may do that once during the production cycle. Uh, besides that, you're never going to be accessing the UICR state. Um, and then you have the receive and the transmit states, which is being used, of course, for RX and TX operation. Um, and when you're running this in a real life application, you will need to be able to cycle through all of the, from the PD state to the PG and to RX and TX and back again to PD. And this needs to be synchronized with what we're doing with the radio. Um, today we're doing this with, uh, with using the pins. So there's a PDN pin and RX and pin and a TXN pin. Uh, you can also do it to SPI, but today the, the software support is for PDN, RXN and TXN pins. Uh, there are a couple of additional pins there. One is for the for the mode pin for setting the output power, so between 10 dB and, and 20 dB. Uh, and there uh, is also an Ansel pin, which is being used to select which of the antennas are going to be used in the uh, during the RX and the TX sessions. Um, so when you're running the, the device like this, so as you can see, you need to, to toggle pins continuously, you know, to make this work. So you have the PDN pin, a RX enable pin and the RF pins. Um, and when you're running this is um, you need to synchronize uh, the, the control signals with the radioactivity. Uh, and that means that they need to be timed quite accurately. There's only a few microseconds uh, between the different edges in, in this diagram. Uh, and if you don't match with the timing. You may either get problems with uh, with accuracy, the the performance. You may get increased power consumption and so on. You can also run into regulatory issues. 
because of this, we have uh, integrated the support heavily into the SDK where we do it. Um, all of the timing and the signal sequencing and everything is controlled directly by software delivered from our side. And because of that, it becomes quite easy to, to get it integrated. Um, so when you're looking at the 21540DB, um, as I said earlier, the 21540DK DK is a development kit which is very similar to the 52840DK where we have removed the quad SPI flash. Uh, this is a supported build target in NF Connect SDK. Um, so you will see that the, the primary sample that we use for testing when we test it on our side is the Bluetooth peripheral UART sample. Um, and this is production tested from our side. Uh, but you can run it with uh, with any other Bluetooth sample as well as with Thread and Zigbee. Uh, as soon as you add this kit, we add a lot of configurations that allows you to add the MPSL support and uh, with the front-end uh, extension uh, for both Bluetooth and Thread and Zigbee. Uh, but have in mind that when you are looking at using the, the, the 21540, uh, together with uh, with Bluetooth, we only support this with the Nordic Softwise controller. So there are two Bluetooth controllers or, or link uh, layers in the NF Connect SDK. One of them is coming from the open source project, uh, the Cephi project. The other one is the Nordic Softwise controller. Um, and the Nordic Softwise controller is the only one which is supported together with MPSL. So this is the only one where we have the native support for the NF21540. Uh, we also do support direct test mode and radio testing samples. Um, when you're looking at the 21540EK, uh, as I talked about earlier, this is the nice one if you want to run it with any other 52 device or with the 53. <coughs> this is not a kit in itself when you're looking or a board that you will select as a build target when you're building with the Connect SDK. Uh, this is supported as a shield, so you add the shield to your project. When you do that, we automatically add in all of the configuration settings as, as for we do for the 21540DK. Um, and then you get the automatic support for MPSL with front end and so on. Um, and so very similar to what we do with the, with the DK part here. Uh, this can be used as a template when you're adding 21540 support to custom PCBs. So if you have your own PCB and then you want to uh, add the 21540 support, you pull in the shield because it comes with the configuration that you need to have, uh, and then you would be able then to uh, to remap the pins that you are using for, for setting it up. Um, so when you add the, the support into the, when you're using the, the DK or the EK as, a, uh, as included into your project, uh, we will add some DTS files. So this is the DTS file from the for the 21540EK. Uh, you can see here it includes the, the pin interface. So you have the, uh, the, the pin mapping for the TX pins, the RX pins, the PDN pins, and so on. All of it comes in with this one, and it also includes the, the configuration for the uh, for the SPI, so which SPI to be used, and then you have to configure the SPI pin out in the, in the SPA part. So this is a DTS file that comes in as an overlay file and that you would then be able to edit and, and, uh, and use with it. Um, and it looks the same with, uh, with the 21540DK. The, the, I think the only difference you will be able to see is that uh, in the EK file, uh, these are the two only blocks in the DTS file. In the, in the DK file, they are split up. So you have the front-end mod, uh, front module for yourself while the, the SPI module is, is in together with all of the other SPI modules on the, on the DK side. Uh, so, but this is how you set it up. When you've done this one, it should work out of the box. There, is, there are additional files where the timing parameters for the front-end modules and everything is in. You can go in and tune it. We recommend to not do it uh, for the 21540. And the, the, the structure is built up because we also do support running with other front-end modules, so front-end modules from, from other companies, uh, and it's being included in the same way. So this is specifically for the 21540. If you pick the generic support, you will get the same kind of system with the overlay files, with pinouts, where you define where the pins are going to be connected, and so on. 
And then you also will need to go through the files where you go in and change the timing for them. So it's a nice feature that was added to the, uh, the NF Connect SDK um, a couple of releases ago, uh, but we added the new support uh, also for the for the Y9 release. We added support for 53.40 running with generic uh, uh, front-end models there. Um, and as soon as you have enabled uh, or included the DTS files, this is the um, this is the kconfig settings visit that comes with uh, uh, with Second Embedded Studio. You will get a similar one up if you if you open it with uh, with VS Code. Uh, this one has the settings where you can uh, go in and, and 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 tune parameters. But as you can see, by default we have added. Uh, the radio front-end module FEM support, it by default adds the 21.540 within GPI and mode settings and everything. Uh, so this comes in automatically when you pick the 21.540 DK as the, as the build target. Uh, if you use the EK in, as, a, as a shield, it will look quite similar to this. Um, so when you're looking at the reference circuitry for the 21.540, this is basically the same as we have on the DKs. It does not include the SOC, so uh, it assumes a 50 ohm input on the RFI. Um, so you need to, if you have an SOC, you need to have the machine network for the for the SOC to get a, a 50 ohm line going into the TRX port on the 21540. In this case here, we are set up with a single antenna port, so we're only using ANT1. Uh, you can see you have a four component matching network, and then you get a 50 ohm output from this one. Uh, we are terminating the the, the unused antenna port. Um, so this is terminated with a RF compliant uh, 49.9 ohm resistor. And this is basically to ensure that we get enough damping on the unused port. Uh, and then of course you need to connect the, the signal pins. What we are doing with the current software, as I said, we're using pin control. So you need a mode pin, the RX enable pin, the TX enable pin and the PDN pin. And the SEK pins are not needed. Uh, for this, and of course, decoupling when you're running with it. You also have a secondary option, which is to run with both antennas, which is what we do on the DK on the EK. As you can see, there's identical matching networks uh, uh, on antenna two as it is to antenna one. Besides that, all of the pins are the same. Um, so a little bit on the, on the on the power consumption and what we're seeing with the device. So when you're running TX, of course, when you're running with a PA with much higher output power, you will get significantly more power consumption than you do with uh, with SOC alone. Uh, on a TX, we are seeing 110 milliamps when you're running 20 dBm, and we're seeing around 38 milliamps when you're running with 10 dBm. So this comes in addition to the SOC current. And for the RX side, with the LNA operating, we are all the way down to 2.9 milliamps. And in the PG state, which is a state where you basically transition through when you're running the, the code, uh, we are at 1.1 milliamps. So it will operate very shortly in this time. Most of the time we're running Bluetooth, for instance, you will be in the power down mode uh, where you are actually only consuming 45 nanoamps typically. It's extremely low power consumption here. So I think that concludes the, the, the basic um, technical run through. We do recommend that you register for upcoming Nordic tech webinars. Um, we do them regularly. Uh, you can, uh, of course, register to www.nordicsemi.com webinars. Uh, and we also, if you if you subscribe, you will be able to, to get emails when we are uh, opening up for registration for new webinars as well. So let's move over to Q&A.